Thank you everyone for joining our fireside chat today. Climate change, can the US and China work together? We like to give a huge nod to the students and teachers in our audience. We hope that you'll be inspired and encouraged by today's conversation so that you can tackle some of these questions and challenges in your studies or your students' studies. This event is a result of China Focus Essay Contest held annually. This year's contest is organized by China Focus, a student publication at the UC San Diego School of Global Policy and Strategy, and is jointly hosted by the Fudan UC Center on Contemporary China, the 1990 Institute, the Carter Center, and UCSD's 21st Century China Center. I think I can say on behalf of all the co-hosts that we're very pleased with the record number of essay submissions we received this year, and that we are looking forward to this incredibly apropos discussion today about climate change and bilateral cooperation between the US and China. From the 1990 Institute's perspective, where we work with secondary school teachers to implement ethnic and AAPI studies and bridge the information gap about US-China relations, we're seeing increased interest from teachers on how to incorporate climate change into their lessons and class discussions that aren't the typical science studies. And with United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres announcing last week that we're in a state of global boiling rather than global warming. And with the upcoming summits like Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation Summit, where President Xi and Biden will meet yet again, and the UN Climate Change Conference or COP28 happening later this year, global attention has turned toward this very topic once again. So I'm really pleased to introduce to you the speakers for this fireside chat. And we'll start with Dr. Michael Davidson, an assistant professor at the School of Global Policy and Strategy and the Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering Department of the Jacobs School of Engineering. He's an active researcher affiliated with the 21st Century China Center. His research focuses on renewable energy at scale, both the engineering and policy aspect in energy deployment. He's particularly interested in emerging electricity markets, including China and India, as well as the Western United States. He's currently a Public Intellectuals Program Fellow at the National Committee of U.S.-China Relations. He was previously the U.S.-China Climate Policy Coordinator for NRDC and a Fulbright Scholar. He has received fellowships from the MIT Energy Initiative and Martin Family Society of Fellows for Sustainability. He has a PhD in Engineering Systems at MIT and, at, and while at MIT was a member of the Xinhua MIT China Energy and Climate Project. Next up is Anne Alice Tisha is a graduate student at Johns Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies. She's also the co-founder of the China-focused VBridge conference and a co-president of the Vanguard Think Tank. She graduated from University of Oxford, where she studied in the development of international development. And finally, last but not least, Graham Rivera is an undergraduate student at the University of Kansas studying political science, and he's a member of the debate team. His research interests include U.S.-China relations, arms control, and strategic stability. So with that, let's get started. Michael, over to you. Great. Well, thank you, Suzanne. Thank you all for joining us. This is such an exciting uh, panel and opportunity to congratulate um, our winners for this year's contest so that uh, both Anne Alice and Katerina, who couldn't, her co-author could not join us because she's currently in China, which is great. Um, and then as well as Graham, uh, who, and so I'm really pleased to have both of you here uh, to talk about your work and have a conversation about US-China climate cooperation. This is a very timely topic. For those of you following, you know that the special envoy for climate change, John Kerry, just visited, just came back from a visit in Beijing. Uh, and the result of that, if you read one headline, was no agreement. And so the this is a particularly uh, emblematic of the current state of relations between our two countries, that it's difficult for um, the envoys to even come to an agreement on what to do on climate change. This is coming off of uh, just two years ago, a Glasgow agreement on climate change made at the UN Climate Conference, which essentially set uh, the stage for what might be possible in terms of US-China climate cooperation in this new era of geopolitical competition. Um, 
which was significantly more scaled back than the era of climate cooperation that we had under President Obama, for example. Um, but nevertheless, this visit by John Kerry, um, I think, represents a stepping stone for more engagement on climate. And hopefully, as mentioned later this year at APEC, uh, when President Xi will be visiting San Francisco, there will be an opportunity for more discussion as well as at the climate change conference later. Um, there are many important topics that they could talk about. Um, you know, China's booming clean tech sector, U.S.'s rejuvenation of manufacturing and clean tech, uh, China's continuing domestic debates around coal and build out and other issues, um, as well as perennial debates around energy security and what renewables and the low carbon transition are going to do for uh, traditional uh, concerns around energy security and the increasing extreme weather events and their impacts on our grid. This is therefore a very timely uh, essay contest and set of essays for our two co-authors to introduce some ideas into this space about what the two countries could do, how they could cooperate on climate change, what is possible given the current state of affairs and what is necessary most importantly in order to uh, achieve our climate objectives. Uh, so I think I want to start off with um, each of you, invite each of you to provide a short summary of your main arguments about where you see U.S. climate cooperation headed or why not, and some recommendations. And then we'll get into some a little fireside chat between all three of us on some to dig into those a little bit uh, first. So I don't know if, and Alice, I can, I can hand it over to you first to provide a short summary. Of course. Um, thank you, Professor Davidson. So uh, Katarina and uh, I wrote uh, this essay with the title Politics Out the Way Towards a Deeper U.S.-China Green Cooperation, which kind of uh, actually echoes the headline from The Guardian a, co uh, a couple of days ago, where climate crisis must be separated from politics. Anyways, uh, about our essay. So we firstly analyzed the development of domestic climate policies in the U.S. and China, respectively, to see what progress each country has made over the years. Uh, we then focus on four areas where we see potential in a deepening bilateral co cooperation, so what they can do together. So the four research areas, uh, sorry, the four areas of our research are climate finance, bilateral trade, research and development, and local level or people-to-people -people exchange. Uh, we examine the feasibility and hurdles in each of those potential areas, and then proposed effective multilateralism as a potential alternative or a complementary measure should U.S.-China collaboration in those four areas not be feasible. Uh, so we believe that effective multilateralism is bringing more stakeholders from the private, social, nonprofit sectors, along with um, governments and in international organizations uh, together to perhaps alleviate direct tensions between the two uh, great powers, but also result in a more implementable uh, solution because there would be less pushback from those sectors um, at the end of the day. So lastly, while we see collaboration as an ideal scenario and push for effective multilateralism, even if China and the US can't agree on cooperation, we do see a silver lining where maybe co a green competition could eventually lead to carbon reduction on both sides. So that's pretty much it. Um, over to Graham. Thank you. Thanks, Graham. My paper is more focused on the US side of things, uh, why the status quo policy of taxing subsidized solar panels is imprudent uh, and what policymakers should do instead. So my paper charts the rise of what I call green protectionism in America, a set of policies aimed at shielding domestic renewable producers from foreign, particularly Chinese, competition. Uh, this includes both local production requirements embedded into the recent Inflation Reduction Act and countervailing taxes on solar panel imports originally implemented by the Obama administration. Uh, but Republicans and Democrats alike have converged on the need to throw up walls against Chinese manufacturers and squeeze almost the entire renewable supply chain into the United States. Um, I argue policymakers should rebuff tariffs on solar panels and instead launch a green industrial policy tailored to the American economy's strengths. So I'll focus here. Um, I talk about different risks, but the largest one 
um, is that by needlessly raising the prices of solar panels, green protectionism could imperil the domestic transition to clean energy. Uh, China's advantage in downstream manufacturing is almost undeniable. Uh, it enjoys perhaps the most developed mass production infrastructure on the planet, the world's largest pool of labor, and easy access to nearby raw materials. Tapping into this potential through global supply chains has led to dramatic cost reductions. But tariffs are one reason the U.S. has some of the highest solar costs in the world. Um, cost reductions are very important for decarbonization um, because projects need to attract investors um, and they will not be able to do so if they can't underprice incumbent fossil fuels. Um, my conclusion is that the climate crisis demands a policy strategy beyond autarky. So the U.S. should slash tariffs and import duties on renewable energy. Um, and instead, policymakers should turn their attention to supporting the areas in the renewable supply chain where America wields a comparative advantage. So the best opportunity, I think, for an expanded U.S. commitment is knowledge-intensive R&D. So we could uh, uh, deploy the toolbox of a green industrial policy here, tax credits, low interest loans, et cetera. Um, but ultimately, my argument is that China is offering to pick up part of the tab for global decarbonization and that American lawmakers should not become so immersed in hard-nosed competition that they snub this offer. Well, excellent. Thanks to both. So I, I want to dig into some of the, the details of this argument, but first, um, I guess take a little bit of a step back and ask each of you, how did you come to this topic? Uh, so I know we have a lot of young folks as well as educators of students in the audience. And I and I think we're all really interested to know how you how you how you came to think about this topic, which of course merges a lot of different interests. So I don't know if Anne Alice, we can, can start with you and then over to Graham. Okay, thank you. So um I'm from the Czech Republic. Um growing up as the only person with Chinese heritage or with any non-Czech heritage, uh, in a culture with little factual knowledge and many misunderstandings of China, I always ended up explaining myself a lot and ha like having to have uh, China facts ready. So growing up, it just became like second nature to me, um, researching things about China. I also lived in China for a couple of years because, uh, because of family reasons. Um, so I ended up really liking to talk about the subject and um, educating people on um, maybe, you know, trying to change their minds in terms of the misunderstandings. So that's sort of how I pivoted to China when I w went to university to study international relations. And uh, to the energy transition specifically, I actually took a course by Professor Sarah Eaton at Humboldt University. Uh, in Berlin during my uh, COVID era study abroad. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was such a non-controversial topic for me. And China was sort of an emerging leader in the in the in this sector. Um, so that sparked a lot of interest and I've been researching it ever since. I wrote my um, two dissertations on on China on China's energy transition. Um, I think my answer is um, much less interesting um, and, and personal. I, I find the climate crisis in general intriguing because I think it's such a compelling demonstration of politics obstructing progress. Um, it's a problem with a relatively simple and known solution, but um, going about solving it is extremely difficult um, and national interests conflict. So. Uh, the fact that the United States and China can't find a way forward on uh, climate change is just such an interesting um, area of study for me. Um, so I thought that was the better fit. Um, I'm more familiar with the language of international relations and uh, climate change than uh, other topics. And I also saw it as an opportunity to fill in, um, I think, a gap in my knowledge. Uh, and so I wanted to embrace the opportunity to dive into the literature base and synthesize an argument from, from what I find. Great, yeah, thanks. No, I, I think that's really helpful for folks coming in to see that you can look at the climate perspective and come 
come to working on climate issues and China issues uh, from very different um, backgrounds and very different different perspectives. Uh, so I want to dive in just a little bit, and I'll start start with you. Um, so you know, you mentioned the clean energy race could be very positive, right, for the climate, as well as for bilateral relations. Now, we tend to think of competition, and particularly the current level competition, is not very good for bilateral relations, and hence why clean tech is now kind of, a, and not at the center, but is maybe one of the loci of the challenges facing competition between our, our, two, um, our two countries. So under what conditions do you think clean energy competition would be positive for both? So uh, I don't have the, I'm not an expert on this. Uh, I don't have the facts and figures and I didn't do any uh, economic modeling. Uh, but the conceptual argument is that if uh, the US cares about China winning the, or like not winning the climate uh, or the energy transition, and China is the same, then both of them will invest a lot of money and effort and energy into developing their respective um, industries or even, um, you know, form coalitions internationally, become um, an international climate leader. Uh, if that happens, then there are two great powers um, working towards climate change and that could potentially be a positive but again it's a conceptual theoretical argument who knows what would actually happen yeah i mean i i think you you laid out clearly i think one one perspective in this debate which is that competition is going to induce more activity more investment maybe more subsidies etc so um in that context, where where do you see the multilateral system playing a positive role? Maybe, mm -hmm. maybe preventing the clean energy competition from turning to, in a negative direction. Mm -hmm. So, uh, in terms of the multilateralism, we see. Uh, so, Katerina and I talked about this a little a little more, and we sort of disagree on this. Uh, she thinks that the U.S. and China can um, sort of compete in the international order, each of them wanting to be a leader of the international order on like climate change or energy transition. Multilateralism would be an arena where those tensions um, play out rather than something else or worse. Uh, I think from my perspective, um, if I have a bad relationship with one other person, if the two of us are, are in the same room, just the two of us, we probably will fight a lot. But then if other people are brought in to the room, it's less likely that things will get really, really bad. Um, at least we will take the other people in the room into consideration. So my personal perspective is having those stakeholders from other countries, from uh, more walks of life, especially the private sector, which both countries care about a lot right now, given COVID recovery, I think that could allevi alleviate the direct tensions between the two uh, governments. No, that's a great, so I, I wanna pass it over to, to Graham here now, because I think, Graham, I, I mean, I, I get your argument, right? Green protectionism is, is bad, right? We shouldn't be taxing good things that we need to achieve the climate goals, we should be, trying to subsidize them, we should try to bring in, we should be try to influence markets, et cetera. But are there instances in which green protectionism works? Right, because people will of course point to China's history and say there's lots of protectionism in this area. So do you think that, is there an area where this would work in the United States or is it a categorically going to be bad for us and our climate goals? Um, I think for potential developing countries, a little bit of protectionism to uh, stimulate manufacturing just to get it started um, can help. But I, I think I, I like to make the distinction between sort of like protectionism for import substitution versus protectionism to set up an industry that is oriented towards exports. 
Could that be auspicious in the context of the United States? Probably not, um, just because of the structural features of the American economy, um, very uh, more knowledge intensive and a much more shallow pool of labor and much higher uh, uh, labor costs. Um, I think that, you know, one of the phrasings that I saw an author describe it is that, um, I, you know, America should not hold on to manufacturing jobs with white knuckles, especially considering that um, it's likely that installation jobs, which will be like 90% of the jobs involved in um, solar processes or uh, the solar industry uh, will offset the loss of manufacturing. Um, so in the context of the United States, I think that rather than stimulating industry, it's more likely that it will just artificially prop up competitors that just optimally would not be located in the United States. Um, and that is more likely to give rise to the problems of rent seeking. Like if those um, companies depend on tariffs and uh, being sheltered from international competition for their very existence, then it's a lot more likely that they will develop an appetite for protection and sink a bunch of resources into trying to extend that protection, uh, protection um, from the government instead of becoming more productive. Um, so that's why I think just the features of the American economy, protectionism is, is not the right fit. Yeah, and I, I mean, these are some similar arguments that economists would use to criticize industrial policy kind of more generally. Um, yeah. And, uh, but we can get into some of those nuances. Uh, I wanted to ask another question of you, Graham, because I, um, I think another thread of your argument was around security risks and mentioning that security risks of integrating with China on these technologies are overblown. Um, and I get the energy security argument. Um, but maybe you could explain that briefly and then, you know, comment, are there maybe other elements of security that U.S. policymakers might need to consider uh, besides energy security? Um, so I think that um, basically the, the argument against becoming sort of like dependent on um, uh, China as a result of renewable energy is that um, China could cut off uh, key supplies needed for manufacturing RE, uh, rare, for manufacturing solar panels like rare earth elements in a crisis. But I think that America is already dependent on China for financing and for pharmaceuticals. So if there was a serious geopolitical crisis and China wanted to just really harm the American economy by doing even at yeah, even at immense cost to the Chinese economy, they would have other options. Um, but the other thing is that, uh, you know, oil is m being re reliant on like the uh, on on petro states, um, which research has found like windfall profits from oil can fuel aggression. Um, there's sort of a resource curse where um, regimes that are dependent on oil um, become more aggressive, um, and the U.S. ends up becoming potentially entrapped in conflicts that it doesn't have a vital interest in. So um, continuing to pad the treasuries of petrostates is also a, a hazardous prospect. Um, I do not think that, since petrostates can turn off the tap at any time, right, um, it, the threat compared to renewable energy is insignificant because they don't provide continuous leverage. So after you've sold a solar panel to a country, you can't turn off the tap, whereas you can for oil. Excellent. No, I, I think those are all uh, very, very interesting points that are worth to consider. So I want to embrace this, uh, this fireside nature and invite our students to also pose some of their questions. So maybe, and Alice, we could start with you questions for the that are really interesting to you um, that you want to post either me or Graham and we can start a conversation and then I'll give Graham the same opportunity. Uh, I think because both of you have a um, good overview of the U.S. perspective, as an international, I wonder, 
to what extent is the U.S. climate policy driven by genuine environmental concern? And to what extent is it driven by, you know, domestic politics, election cycle, or just competition with China? Uh, well, I think I think it, it, the U.S. policy space, we can see very clearly that since the Inflation Reduction Act is the most consequential climate piece, piece of climate legislation in a decade or ever, depending on how you count, and it's not even a piece of climate legislation, it's essentially um, uh, a finance and tax and investment and nominally inflation reducing tool uh, that gives you a sense of how politics have shifted in the United States, where now there is a there is a big coalition of folks interested in industrial policy to achieve environmental goals and industrial policy, just as Graham pointed out, creates winners and winners are good for politics. Um, because they help fuel politics. And so I think there, I think we see quite a bit of overlap now among the various objectives. The China competition is another interesting element to throw in this. I don't know, Graham, if you have thoughts on that. I think when it comes to, um, which I, I think basically when reliance on China or uh, uh, kind of like when U.S.-China politics conflicts with carbon reduction, the need to appear tough on China wins. Um, so the U.S. will introduce things like local um, production requirements, uh, I think at the expense of decarbonization uh, to ensure that they are projecting an image of, of strength and bringing manufacturing jobs back to the United States, onshoring, high fences, that sort of thing. Um, joint ventures with China, even by the private sector, are increasingly portrayed as collusion with the enemy. One of the things that I mentioned was there was a joint venture between Ford and I think Goshen um, uh, to set up a battery factory in um, Michigan. and. I believe it did not go through because there was so much domestic backlash that the um, factory would uh, like bring in thousands of Chinese workers and um, it would ha also hide ballistic missiles and spread communism. Um, so as a result, I think even though the U.S. is making significant progress in decarbonization and stimulating renewable energy, the kind of pessimistic perspective is that ultimately is becoming subordinate to um, the need to appear tough on China. Yeah, there's a, yeah, no, that's a great point. I, there were there were two actual projects here. One was Ford and and Cattle uh, that were originally going to Virginia for a joint venture and then settled on a licensing agreement in Michigan and then the Goshen plant, which was a wholly owned foreign. Uh, plant in Michigan, which has now uh, come under some a significant amount of uncertainty. I think those are both really, really good examples. Um, Grant, over to you. What what kind of what questions might you have for an analyst to get us get us thinking maybe in some different directions? Um, I think my I wanted to ask: Do you view climate cooperation as a contributor to a stable U.S.-China relationship? Um, do you think it could help the U.S. and China find a floor, or do you think the causal arrow runs the other way, where cooperation more depends on a prior stable bilateral relationship? I see it uh, as um, going both ways, because I believe that having something to talk about or having one agreement, for example, some uh, like climate cooperation, will provide pathways or uh, will provide institutional um, setting for further agreements on other issues. Um, but also having those two countries collaborate, uh, already like agree on um, collaboration rather than competition will lead to a definitely faster and if not more efficient implementation of um, collaborative carbon reduction. So definitely both ways for me. I think it's a good question. 
Graham, and I think that's a good answer too. It it is not one direction for sure, and depending on the facet of it, it can run in either way. Yeah. Um, well, let's keep this going. And else, what what else is on? What else is bothering you, or what else is interesting and piquing your interest about these topics? So, um, you both of you mentioned um, U.S. China joint ventures. Um, and then them failing, I was wondering, is US-China collaboration absolutely necessary or can the US look elsewhere for collaboration on renewable energy? I don't mean um, fossil fuels, but renewable energy. Because for example, I know that um, South Korean manufacturer Q-Cells has uh, started a factory in Atlanta and they're like part becoming part of the supply chain uh, in the US. So yeah. Thought um, question for both of you. Graham. Oh, okay. Um, the I think that the U.S. absolutely can collaborate with its allies. Um, if you sum up, um, like you know, NATO allies, Japan, South Korea, other U.S. aligned states, like that is a huge portion of um, potential GDP. That I, I think just the, the problem is that. You know, even when you do that, you're still locking yourself out of the most sophisticated production infrastructure on the planet and the world's largest labor pool. And also, like, there's such um, a, a rich history of U.S. China collaboration on like research and development. Um, there are, and that is, I think, detailed in in, in your paper very persuasively. Um, the U.S. They are the two largest emitters. And the signal of not being able to move forward as a result of parochial interests will discourage progress globally. Um, so it's possible, but you know, should not be our first resort. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I, I agree with that. I think the, um, the the challenge is, I think, one of cost and of speed. Um, so if we had unlimited time and unlimited money, then of course, any country could spend all the time to try to develop everything domestically and achieve all, all of the various policy goals. Now in the US, we seem to have a lot of money for industrial policy, but unfortunately the climate isn't gonna wait for us and the speed at which we need to scale up production um, just currently necessitates um, continue work with with China. I mean, we look at just the numbers are just startling. You know, China has rough, around eighty percent of uh, battery module capacity. You know, eighty percent or so of uh, cells modules for solar. Ninety five percent to ninety eight percent of solar ingots and wafers that are then exported to other. Um, uh, some of which are exported to other firms to turn into cells and modules. So the scope of how how much China is at the center of these supply chains now uh, really cannot be overlooked. Um, but I think there's there's a really important question underlying this, which is which is also motivating the policy discourse in Washington, which is how much should we try to diversify? Let's say we we recognize we can't cut China out completely. But maybe we don't want 95% reliance on upstream solar components. How much do we try to diversify and at what cost? I think that's a very relevant question. And this kind of gets closer to, I think, what the Europeans started off in a rebranding this instead of decoupling, calling it de-risking. Um, and we can get into semantic debate about the differences between that, but essentially, what is the the, if the ultimate goal is not to turn the tap from China down to zero, but instead to diversify um, and think about what are the needs for diversification and how much how much are you willing to spend on that? Um, yeah, uh, Ram, maybe a, another another question for from you to get this discussion going. Keep the discussion going. Um, so I wanted to ask. We've, we've, I think, definitely hinted in this direction more, but I wanted to ask, like, kind of directly, if the U.S. and China cannot cooperate, is competition maybe a more auspicious route to decarbonization? 
Um, and what I'm asking is basically like, can the United States and China channel competition into productive domains? Like if they're both striving to um, accrue soft power, compete by appearing to be a climate leader and making strides in decarbonization, um, is that uh, a potential option? I think it's the thing you set you up, and Alice, you, you talked about this before, I think, in response to what about U.S. and China competing on the international order. And I thought you and your co-author had a very interesting disagreement. Do you want to expand upon that? Um, so, yeah, I think there is definitely, um, there's definitely ways in which U.S. and China could respectively channel their um, their um, aspiration to be a leader uh, in climate of, of climate change into more productive ways. Um, but <laughs> I'm not really sure what what else to add to that. I think that would uh, really require more um, I, I yeah, I would need to do more research to really back this up. Uh, whether that would be a potential solution. It, for me, it was more of a theoretical what if uh, scenario. Um, I think based on what you described in the previous answers, the costs would be too great to um, outweigh what a competition uh, between the two could actually bring. Yeah. If I could ask a follow up there, because I, you know, there's, there's a, a discussion, just as you asked about what motivates China, uh, sort of U.S. climate policy currently, there's a question around what motivates China's international behavior. And, uh, you know, a fundamental question as to whether China values being perceived as a positive global, um, say, steward of the climate or, or contributor to solving climate change. Um, or is it maybe more instrumental to achieve certain, um, you know, other geopolitical objectives? And it seems like, depending on how you answer that question, you're going to come to a different conclusion about whether or not competition is a good idea in terms of international order. So I'm curious where you sit in terms of what you think, either what you think China's ultimate goals are, or whether you think how you would play that out, um, depending on what those goals are in terms of how uh, competition in the international space, multilateralism, international orders, et cetera, could, could lead to positive climate benefits? Um, thank you for that question. So in my opinion, China would pursue um, energy transition or um, like policies um, to mitigate climate change either way. Uh, regardless of its surrounding context. So the Chinese government, at least in my opinion, is way, way more concerned with its domestic issues rather than how it is perceived internationally. Uh, definitely it plays part, it it's definitely plays a role on Xi's agenda, but mostly he's concerned about how um, his own citizens and public perceive uh, him and the, the uh, CCP and the central government. Uh, in my opinion, um, the reason why China started pursuing um, the energy transition in such a scale is because it's good for the economy. Um, and also, um, so I actually lived in China between 2008 and then 2013. And I left China in 2013 because I have bad lungs and then the air got too bad for me. Chinese citizens feel the same, felt the same way. So if the CCP or the central government didn't do anything about all the pollution, about uh, climate change, that it is impacting Chinese citizens uh, because of all the floods, all the other uh, natural catastrophes, they would lose legitimacy. And that is the core tenet, I think, of the Chinese government. So really this is more um, their motivation, I believe, is more domestic rather than international. So whatever, like whether there is competition or collaboration, I think they would probably prefer collaboration due to access to American know-how and advanced R&D. 
but overall, it doesn't make a big difference to China in in my uh, in my opinion. All right. Um, other questions from either of you or comments you wanted to make? I Oh, sorry, Graham, do you want to go? Uh, you can go. I actually wanted to ask, uh, so you do have a STEM background too, so you probably understand, or, or you definitely understand <laughs> um, the more engineering part of things and the implementation part of things. And I was wondering, what are the more, or what are the pathways where uh, the two countries can actually um, actually collaborate more in the practical sense? And what are the biggest hurdles? Like in terms of even just being on different continents, is there something preventing cooperation or, um, yeah? Well, that's a great question. Um, yes, I do have a STEM background, but STEM is very big. So I can't pretend to be an expert uh, on all these areas. Um, I, I I will I'll know kind of maybe three levels right of of cooperation or collaboration. Um, you have academic, you have firm industry, and then you have government. Um, and academic would include research institutes and and I think um, de depending on which of those you look at, you might come to a different answer. I think we've certainly gone through a time period where we thought that we needed bilateral government cooperation very deeply and supported, endorsed by both sides in order to make key climate goals. This was sort of the impetus for the clean energy research centers under uh, between Obama and Xi. Um, those, of course, are not functional anymore. Um, jointly developing technology between the two countries endorsed by both governments would be very challenging today. Um, but we do know that we've had lots of cooperation between scientists and research institutes uh, that have generated new, new advances. And we do know we have lots of firms collaborating across borders. And we certainly need to continue those in order to make advances. Um, you know, these are not only the two largest emitters, they're also the two largest spenders on R&D, two most prolific scientific uh, knowledge producers in terms of papers, et cetera. Um, and patents um, and firms are, of course, both active in both both countries investing in these areas. So I think, you know, if, if I had to summarize, I would say, if we can't have all three, let's at least have the first two, and let's try to encourage government policy to to not prevent those academic scientific cooperations and firm level collaborations where it doesn't impede core national interests. Um, and maybe I'll give give Graham the last question or last word or what have you before we open it up to the, the audience questions. I think maybe a good concluding question. Um, ultimately, what is your prognosis uh, for the future U.S.-China climate collaboration? Um, can the two insulate environmental matters from geopolitical competition or is a hard break more likely? Is that question for me and Alice, you wanna you wanna you wanna take a stab at this? Uh, I am just an aspiring student. <laughs> I'm not really an expert. But uh um I think I am more hopeful uh that both of the governments, even if just driven by their domestic politics and their voters and their uh citizens they will pursue a more pro-climate policy. Uh, again, whether that is in collaboration or competition, um, that is for us to see in the future. <laughs> I think that's, that's very important. And also very important to maintain optimism, everyone. My goodness, even at this time, there is always optimism. There are always rational people that can have conversations and try to address problems for the good of global problems like climate change. So thank you for, for reminding us of that.